This morning we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, reading from the New King James Translation. Uh, last time we were, uh, Jesus was continuing, speaking of heavenly things, speaking of um, eternal salvation for each one of us. So, what a blessing. Um, so today uh, I'm going to pick up at verse 19 and read through verse 21 for our primary text today. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, and that they have been done in God. Now we're going to get right into verses 20 and 21. Everyone who, who practices evil hates the light. They don't come to the light because they don't want their evil deeds to be exposed. You know, this isn't news to any of us when you really think about it. It's, it's kind of like the elephant in the room all the time. And Jesus speaks clearly that people are rejecting the light of God, the light of Christ, the light of goodness, because they're doing things wrong and they don't want to have their deeds exposed. They don't want that light to shine on it. Now, brothers and sisters, we, we see a lot of evil in the world. And, and honestly, we wonder why so much of it just continues on and is not stopped. Uh, we see people doing wrong things. We wonder why they don't see that they're the wrong things. We see people that should know better, that allow and even approve of evil practices and lifestyles, habits and actions. Sometimes they even go so far as to misuse these scriptures to justify their wrongdoing. Um, and we see that, and it's heartbreaking. It's like this person is using a scripture, and we don't, and we know that they don't understand what they're saying. Um, we have groups of people, th basically we have three groups of people that we're talking about here, and I'm going to spend an inordinate amount of time on this today uh, because there's so much that we can find in God's Word to help us out here. First thing, we have the ignorant people, then we have the unbelievers, and then we have deceived believers. The ignorant people simply do not know God. Or maybe they've heard about him and they just don't know his ways. In Romans chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 in the uh, New Living Translation says, Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it without even having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written on their hearts for their own conscience and conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. Now that's pretty amazing. You know, everybody knows something about God. God's word tells us he has written into the hearts of men basics of right and wrong. And we, we call this a conscience. And I believe that no matter where a person is born, what their lot is in life, uh, we see kind of the core of the, the commandments and and we can even look at the Ten Commandments and see that uh, many of those are already written into someone's heart and into their life. And they'll try to observe them to do right unless they're intentionally trained against them. Now I say that, unless they're intentionally trained against them. We see uh, some um, groups, we see some religions that actually teach people to do wrong things from the time they're small children and it, it overwrites uh, in their minds and hearts. The, the goodness that God has already tried to plant in our hearts so that we'll be more accepting to them. So the, the verses we just read really leave no excuse for those who are ignorant of God's law when they violate it. Historically, I went back and looked and there are no fewer than 20 different legal codes of behavior that in the ancient wor world. Scholars tend to debate about which cultures uh, stole which rules from which ones and some people uh, even say that the the commandments of, of Moses uh, the Ten Commandments and the other some of the other commandments were were actually taken from another code but I don't think that's true because when the Bible says that God has written these laws upon the hearts it doesn't matter where they're at they're gonna and they start writing down the laws and writing down the uh, you know the rules that their society is to live by these are going to work their way into it 
So to me, it's quite evident that these similarities are because they are all coming from our Creator God and put in the hearts of men. Now here are some of the basics that it seems that, that pretty much all men naturally know. Uh, there is a higher power that's to be respected, followed, and worshiped. And we see that in, in a number of the commandments. Uh, we also see that those who brought life to us, our parents, our ancestors, are people that are to be respected and honored. We also see that we should not take away what belongs to other people, other people's possessions. Um, and that includes things like their spouses, their belongings, the things they own, their health, their body parts, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is, is not simply in one culture. It's like, don't take that away from someone else or you'll be deprived of it. And, and even their lives. All of these things are very commonly seen. And also that we should, we should be truthful and honest in our dealings with other people. And that we should not be envious of other people's, uh, what they have, what other people have, to the extent of being willing to do wrong things to get hold of it. So if you look, most of, the, most of the commandments fall into some of those categories or, or are similar. There are a lot more specific things that God has given us to follow more perfectly His laws. And that's, where we, that's why we study the, the scriptures and, and why we look and see what God has for us day to day. But the vast majority of evil in the world that we see is from people violating the laws that God has naturally given to them. So... What we, what we hear, what I, I remember a fifth grade teacher wrote on the board one time when someone did, violated a school rule that they didn't know about, he wrote up on the board in big letters, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And I think that's what we find here. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. We, we know because God has written certain things on our hearts and we should follow. Now the second group of people that are doing evil in the world are unbelievers. Now, not only are the basics of God's laws written in their hearts, but at some point there's been enough of God's word, enough of God's light that's been revealed to them for them to be able to make a choice and to choose to follow God or not. They've chosen to reject Jesus and intentionally turn against God's true and righteous ways and be as an unbeliever. These people either realize they're committing specific sins or they really don't care to know. They think they love what they're doing. They don't want to change what they're doing. And um, we see Jesus calls them right out on this. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This gets to the heart of why people don't accept the light of Jesus in their own lives. It also goes a long way to explain why even allowing the light of Jesus to shine around them to other people Expose, it exposes things in their lives that they don't want anyone else to see. You know, for them, it's not enough to ignore the message of Jesus Christ. Some feel they have to actively suppress that message and eliminate the possibility that anyone else will hear the message because they don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want, I mean, be honest, people are embarrassed when bad things they're doing are exposed. Well, they should be embarrassed. Nowadays, that doesn't happen either. So now it's socially unacceptable to embarrass someone else by letting them know that what they're doing is wrong. Um, in fact, it's kind of been turned the other way around and, and now people who are standing up for the message of Christ in the Bible are the ones that are being shamed. It's, uh, the world's kind of flipped on us here. They're shamed when they don't readily embrace the more and more unscriptural practices and standards in lives. And yes, that's the age we live in. Um, this, it's, it's, it's very sad and, and it's frustrating. Um, but there's a third group that I find that's probably even more frustrating, and that is deceived believers. These are people who know firsthand the reality of God. They know the truth of God, but they, they allow themselves to fall into the deception of the enemy. And that enemy of our souls wants to do everything they can. They, to, to get people away from following God. People don't like their evil exposed and people don't like Christians exposing anyone else, so they simply don't expose them, okay? Can a true believer go against God's word and stand up for the devil and fight against God by condoning and supporting wickedness? 
I don't think so. But I think we all know people that stand up for things that are wrong and they know the right things and their hearts are just deceived. It's, it's not good. I mean, it's very heartbreaking. How many people and, and, how, and even churches call themselves Christians and then at the same time refuse to condemn uh, homosexuality, for instance. And, and other sins and, and instead embrace them in, in practice and with open arms and saying, yeah, it's okay to be a part of that. You know, you just do things different than we do. How can you love what God hates? How can you love uh, music and listen to music that blasphemes God? There's a, a lot of really, I'm not going to get on, onto a lot of details, but there's a lot of bad music out there. There's a lot of music that, you know, I walk into a, a place and, you know, I was like, could you please turn that music off? <laughs> or I just turn around and walk out because it's, you know, the, the words are, are so anti-God. And, you know, how, you, you, you're nothing without God. He's your father. How can you go against him? and stand up for Satan by, by supporting and allowing these things. We are to hate, and we don't talk about hate a lot, we talk about love a lot, but we also talk about hate. We are to hate everything that God hates. Every biblical leader stood up against evil and many of them lost their lives for speaking against it. Many of them lost their lives to people who were supposed to be religious people. There's a reason that Jesus says that true believers will be hated and persecuted. If you desire to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. There's no way around it. There's, uh, th this is why many believers stay quiet when they're on the hot seat. They're in fear of men. They, they hush when they're afraid of what man may say. And, and you know, God will give us that boldness if we stand up for him. Jesus spoke up. Stephen spoke up. Paul spoke up. Why are we being quiet? We must not be afraid to stand up against wrong. We cannot fear retribution and the rebuke of others. If someone's going astray from Christ, if you're going to be silent so they won't hate you, that's not good. You should lovingly and humbly say something. And I'm not talking about, you know, hating on people. I'm talking, you know, beating them up and telling, oh, you're wrong, you're going to hell. You know, this is, you know, this is terrible. You're... You know, you're nasty and you're a horrible person. No, no, I'm talking about gently, but truly helping correct them, just as we have been corrected at times in our lives. Second, I mean, Second Timothy 2, 22 to 26 tells us, flee also youthful lusts. <laughs> you can add in there, flee also old people's lust. I mean, that's the same thing all the way through life, isn't it, brothers and sisters? You we all seek the same wrong things. But this is encouraging a, a young man in Timothy. Um, flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. And that's, that's pretty straightforward. It covers all the bases, how to correct and how to, you know, what's the result of that? We, the result, the result we're looking for is not to make someone feel bad. It's not to make them look bad. The result is to help God grant them repentance. God to make a change in their hearts so that they will repent and, and follow God more closely. And escape, like I said, escape the snare of the devil. Um, and it says they've already been captive, taken captive by him to do his will, to Satan's will. I and mean, that's not a good place for a believer to be there. But this is who this is talking to. So let's work together with those and, and help gently bring people into following the Lord in their lives. You know, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of its sin as we share God's word with others. We use his word. If we stop defending Christianity, if we stop exposing evil and, and rebuking teachers that are just telling people the wrong things and, and, and 
then we start lovingly correcting. We, start, we, we stop lovingly correcting believers. More people will be lost, more people will be led astray, the more people will believe false teachings. We don't want that to happen, okay? Look how many people take just a little bit of words, a few words they know. Um, how many of you have heard someone say, when you're you know, looking at a situation and say, you know, that needs to be changed. There's something wrong. That person's life needs, they, they, they really need to change their lives. And we hear someone all saying, well, judge not that ye be not judged. That's the only portion of a verse they know in the entire Bible. The Bible says judge not. Well, they have no idea what the rest of the Bible says. And they make it mean, they try to make it mean something completely different. Yes, we are to judge in many circumstances. Yes, they, they kind of miss those verses where the Bible does say, judge this, judge that. You are to judge. And, and in fact, that we are going to be um, held accountable when we do not judge in certain circumstances. And so, you know, that's why we study the scriptures. We, we don't want to be encouraging witnesses when, to be, by remaining quiet in these times. We don't want to just step back and allow God to be mocked. Because the Bible says God is not mocked. Don't be deceived. The person who truly loves Christ is the one that's going to stand up for him no matter if they lose friends or family, if the world hates you. Remember, we've all be, been deceived at one time or another. We've all been there. Each of us needs to be careful and carefully guarding our hearts against deception of any kind. There's no question that Adam and Eve knew the goodness of God, right? I mean, they knew he was real. They walked and talked with him every day in the garden. He created them. He told them the story about it. I don't know how many times and ways in the garden. Um, he cre created the entire world. They, world. they gave, he gave them everything. They knew his law. It was really simple back then. Don't eat from that tree. And in fact, he even told them why. When you eat it, you're going to die. You're going to be separated from me. And, and you know, <laughs> but guess what? They still fell into the deception. And don't think that we are not capable of falling into deception when we are not on guard in our lives. So let's look at six ways. And I want to use a lot of scriptures in this so that we do not fall into that category where we are doing evil because we're deceived. Okay? Six ways we can avoid spiritual deception in our lives. Number one, we must be genuinely born again and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. John 10, 27 to 28, Jesus said that he knows those who belong to him and that his sheep hear his voice and no one can steal his sheep. Those who hear and obey the voice of Christ, they're able to discern the difference between the voice of the enemy and the voice of God. It's only when you, this only happens though when you have a true relationship, a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. The second thing, we must love the truth that's found in the Word of God. Victims of deception can be those people who do not love and study the truth. They'll not love the truth, don't study it. It's difficult to properly interpret the Word of Truth. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 4 in the Amplified Bible says, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires to support the errors they hold. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and will wander off into myths and man-made fictions and will accept the unacceptable. Can you tell that's the amplified version? But that's, you know, that, that's so important to, to not find, look for those things um, that only sound good to us. Um, Trying to think of the exact words that, that are used, but uh, recently heard someone, uh, someone say that uh, people don't want to hear the truth, they just want to hear someone else call what they believe to be the truth. So, you know, the scripture indicates that deception is sometimes a matter of choice. In other words, people who are deceived and love falsehoods because it suits their inner sinful passions, for instance. We see this in, in um, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the sexual sins and sexual deviations 
um, back in back in the old days in, in the scriptures we see many times where there are temples temples religious dwellings religious places that have, were full of sexual immorality because those people had gathered together and all agreed that yes it is okay in fact it's good the gods want us to do things that are you know what the true god yahweh <laughs> says are wrong so if you hate the truth because the truth speaks against your sinful and sinful desires we've got to change that and it's not just in the sexual areas a lot of areas loving god's truth no matter what it says to us prevents this willful deception in our lives number three we must love righteousness and hate evil romans 12 9 says abhor what is evil that's pretty strong abhor what is evil cling to what is good in the new living translations uh, colossians 3 says uh, in verse 5 so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality impurity lust and evil desires don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world verses 8 and 10 but now is the time to get rid of anger rage malicious behavior slander and dirty language don't lie to each other for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. A lot of good stuff. Verses 12 to 17, again in Colossians 3. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy. See, there's a really good side. With tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And the peace that comes from Christ, rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, what a contrast we see there between the evil that we're to put off and the good that we should be clinging to. Praise God, it, it, it gives, God God's word gives us these things that we, we can see as fruit in our lives and as evidence that he is working in our lives. Now, the fourth thing to help you uh, avoid deception is we must hate the world's philosophies and value systems. <clears throat> you know, hate's a strong word. And it's appropriate here. When you hate something, you do everything you can to avoid it, to prevent it from becoming a part of your life. You, you want it to stay away from those that you love. And we're talking about things here that are in direct conflict with God's values. Rejecting common worldly ideas and instead clinging to God's word enables us to avoid spiritual deception in these matters. We see in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, do not love the things, excuse me, <clears throat> do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. What a great promise. The world's values, again, are incompatible with God's values in so many ways. And that's why the last two ways are so vital in our life. Uh, way number five, we must walk in the Spirit. John 16, 13, Jesus says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, and whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit is essential towards helping us avoid living in deception or being led astray. The Holy Spirit will help us discern between the truth and falsehoods through the standards of the scriptures. Walking in the Spirit of God enables us to walk in God's truth but living according to the flesh or the sin nature leads us into spiritual deception. 
Okay? Walking in the Spirit enables to walk in God's truth. Living according to the flesh leads us into spiritual deception. How do we walk in the Spirit? By obeying God's Word, trusting in His Word. Trust is a big thing. Galatians 5, 16 to 17 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. That's sometimes difficult. Our fleshly desires may not always want to walk 100% according to the Spirit of God, and it can be a struggle. Does that mean you don't know Jesus? No, it just means you're struggling sometimes. But the Spirit of God wins. When, when the Spirit of God wins the struggle, we both win the struggle. I encourage you to dig into Galatians. A little homework here for you. You, you know I like to give you homework. Dig into Galatians chapter five, 5. Read about the liberty we have in Christ and how to use that liberty. And I'm going to jump to number 6. And that is we must study the scriptures. We need to be fact checkers, spiritual fact checkers. We hear about that a lot in the world today, fact checkers. And, you know, what's the source of their facts? What's the source of, of the, the wisdom? And most of the time, the, the fact checking is, uh, uh, tends to use a worldly viewpoint. And so we need to use the scriptures to always check things against the scriptures. Acts 17, 10 to 11 says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So we find the Berean Christians there were both very open to receive the word of truth, and at the same time, they didn't just accept the culture of just being spiritually spoon-fed. No, no, they didn't accept the word if it didn't line up with the scriptures. They checked it. I want to encourage you, if you've been coming here, you've been listening to what I've been teaching, don't ever accept just my word for it. Okay? I might be off. I'm not trying to be deceptive or off, but I might be off sometimes. But when you look at the scriptures, the scriptures are not going to be off. So always check it according to that. And, and if you find that, please let me know. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to, to be teaching anything that's not uh, true to the word. Sometimes I do have an opinion that I might, might express as well. But uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to have anything taught that's not lining up with scriptures. So do dig into the scriptures. I want to, I want to use the scriptures to help you grow in the Lord. Uh, the people in Berea continue to be a great example. I mean, here we are uh, over 1,900 years later, and we're still talking about these Christians that were in Berea, digging into the scriptures and saying, hey, I like what you're saying. Let me check to make sure the scriptures support that. Make sure that, oh yeah, the scriptures, yeah, you're right. That's exactly what the Bible says. That's exactly what the scriptures say. So we, that will help you avoid um, spiritual deception. Now we talked before about 1 John uh, four, one to three, where the Bible tells us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they be of God, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh of God is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have already heard was coming, and is now already in the world. It's essential that we learn to test and verify all things through the Word of God and discern which spirit is really behind the teachings that we listen to and that we hear. Paul also warns us in 1 Timothy 4, 1-2 that the Holy Spirit uh, warns us of deceiving spirits that will teach people doctrines of demons and will cause people to depart from the true faith by causing them to follow demonic teachings. Now, does a, does a demon that's teaching, does he stand up and say, I am a demon. I am going to teach you wrong things that will lead you astray from God and cause your soul to be lost forever from God, but you'll end up in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. No, 
They're not going to do that. Absolutely not. They're going to say, I'm of God. This is what God says to you. And they're going to turn and they're going to twist and they're going to mess you up. But if you know the scriptures, you can't be deceived. You won't be deceived. And you notice something that keeps coming up through all of these things we're talking about? God's word is the standard. Failure to actively guard against spiritual de deception in our lives leads to first tolerating evil <coughs> in the lives of others and then in our own lives and then eventually to not even knowing the difference between good and evil. This, my brothers and sisters, is not a place that we want to be. It's a very dark place and that's what we're talking about today is darkness versus light. Light shining in the darkness. So, if you're not careful, you'll find yourselves going out of your way to block the light from shining in your life. So don't let that happen. As a review, remember these six ways to guard against spiritual deception. One, we must be genuinely, genuinely born again and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Two, we must love the truth found in the Word of God. Three, we must love righteousness and hate evil. Four, we must hate the world's philosophies and value systems. Five, we must walk in the Spirit. Six, we must study the Scriptures. Now, the Bible is the ultimate standard for our Christian walk. It's, and it's therefore important that the teachings, be, all of our teachings, be measured against the Word of God. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ himself used the Scriptures to avoid being deceived by the devil's deceptions and suggestions. Uh, another piece of homework for you, make a note to study Matthew 4, 1 to 11 to see how Jesus did this. If you go to a fellowship and someone gets up to speak, to preach, to talk, to teach you the Word of God or to, to preach and they never open the Bible, they never quote a scripture, they talk about all kinds of nice things, but they don't tell you what God's Word says, it's a bad place to be. And you should be looking for something else, somewhere else to be. Um, you know, I was really, I was wanting to go further on in the chapter, but I'm not going to have time today. Um, these things are so important in each of our lives that we've got to get a firm grasp on them as we go through these last days together. I think we all feel that we're in the last days. Before I finish, I'd like to dig just a bit deeper into uh, an aspect of these verses that we need to be watching in our lives. Darkness. What's the deal with darkness and light? We, we've seen that contrast a number of times here in John. It, it, is there really something about literal darkness that equates with wrongdoing? That's an interesting question. Of course, we know the obvious thing is that if you do something wrong in the dark, it's less likely to be seen by someone you know, with eyes out here in, in the world and to be caught by others than doing something in broad daylight but there's something about darkness itself that promotes or encourages wrongdoing. I read, a, <coughs> I read a very interesting study at a, a major university. A leading psychologist and his colleagues recruited 84 students and divided them between, put some of them in a very brightly lit room and put others in a very dimly lit room. And each one of them, they gave them an envelope with $10 in, in, in dollar bills and, and in coins and gave, they gave them five minutes to complete a series of simple mathematical tasks. They could keep 50 cents each time they completed a task. And the results were anonymous, so nobody knew how much each one took. The envelopes were turned back in. And, uh, but they, they did keep track of how many actually solved those little mathematical problems. And when the researchers re reviewed the, uh, the results, they found <laughs> some pretty striking information. Consistently, the people in the dimmer room reported finding almost 50% more successes than those in the bright room. But does that mean that darker rooms make you smarter? <laughs> no. When it was checked, it turned out that cheating was pervasive in the dark room. The participants actually completed fewer tasks than those in the bright room. Now, some of those in the bright room also cheated a little bit, but it's a very, very small percentage of them. Those in the darker room cheated five times as much as those in the brighter room. And we're just talking about physical brightness and darkness in a place. They concluded that the darkness seemed what we know and what Jesus told us, 
Darton seemed to confer what the researchers called a false sense of concealment, uh, which in turn created a, a kind of a licensing effect, giving them permission to do wrong even though they were acting anonymously and knew, knew they wouldn't be caught doing wrong, they still did more wrong in the darkness than those in the light. So yes, darkness, both physical and spiritual, gives a false sense of permission for people to do sin and to do wrong. How much better is it to be living in the light of God's word and to be able to shine the bright light of Jesus and to be able to shine that light into others in this dark world. All of it feeds directly into verse 21, which we read, which says, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. I wanna conclude with uh, Matthew uh, chapter five, verses 14 to 16, where Jesus expands on this even, even more and says, you, talking to those who are accepting his teaching, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, let's take these things to heart. Be that light of the world every day. Be a city that is set on a hill. It's never too late or too early in your life to let that light shine, to let others clearly see the good works that you're doing by the Holy Spirit to bring glory to your Father in heaven. We all, unfortunately, we all fall, fall short and we can kind of make some first steps or make some continuing steps by simply confessing our shortcomings to God. He'll forgive that, that's called sin. You know, it's not a, you know, sin is not only going out and committing something that's horrible. Sometimes it's just not getting to where God wants us to be. So he will forgive those things in our lives as we confess. He will cleanse us from the unrighteousness still in our lives. He'll build our faith day by day as we let him. And you can pray something simple from your heart. Something like, God, I confess to you I've fallen short again. I've not always done the things you want me to do. I've done wrong things, thought wrong thoughts, and not done things that are pleasing to you. Please forgive me of those things and all of that and clean my heart and life. And I accept you. I continue to accept you, the risen Christ as my Lord. Thank you for bringing me into the family of God. That's something we can do every day if you need to. You know, I'm not one that says you have to do bad, bad things every day, but you know what? I think most days we're probably a little short of where we think, you know, where God wants us to be. And uh, it's a good thing to start each day, you know, letting, getting that relationship with God going again and saying, you know, Lord, I'm here for you. Please forgive me if I, where, where I come short, help me to go, come closer to where I need to be today. If you have any questions about your relationship with God or if there's anything you'd like for us to pray with you about, um, don't hesitate to ask Mitzi or me. <clears throat> uh, next week we're going to see a little more. We're going to back up. We're not going to back up in scriptures, but back up to <coughs> the ministry of John the Baptizer. And uh, as Jesus' ministry is being propelled forward now, and John the Baptizer is also, has also grown tremendously, and we're going to see that these are not two ministries competing against each other, but really just one ministry. And uh, so that's going to be an interesting uh, study next week. I'll try to get through the rest of John chapter 3 there. So I'd like to pray a blessing over each one of you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you.